Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Joanne, and I'll be your guide this morning. I'd like to have your attention here at the map on the wall. So our museum has six rooms with relics in display, and we're going to tell the story of the Delaware or Lenny Lenape Indians. Well, if she, she quiets down, he come back in with her. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Or if she had a, a bottle or something. Okay, so this is called the map of migration. And archaeologists believe that as early as 32,000 BC, man could have crossed the Bering Strait, which is a waterway that froze over. Um, and these first men came from the lower tip of Russia across the Bering Straits into our state of Alaska. And the reason these men were wandering is these people were searching for food. And the animals that they hunted are now extinct, such as the woolly mammoth and the mastodon. Finally, by about 10,000 BC, the earliest Native Americans started to settle here in our state of Pennsylvania. Now I'd like to pick up the story here in the cave scene. The little guy you see here is called Paleolithic Man, and that means early or old. He survived on the animals that he was able to hunt down and kill, and he lived in caves or rock shelters similar to the one we see here. Um, a real brief, I want to talk about a mastodon that was discovered here in the area, two miles south of the museum. Um, it's across from Price Chopper by the Wendy's. There's a peat moss bog on the other side of the hill. Mm -hmm. And in 1968, a gentleman was digging up peat moss with a backhoe. And his bucket came up with a huge bone, and they knew it was too large to be a farm animal. Experts were brought in, and he, it turned out, discovered the complete petrified skeleton of a mastodon, which is now on display in the State Museum in Harrisburg, in Pennsylvania. So if you're ever lucky enough to visit Harrisburg, near the Capitol building is the Pennsylvania State Museum, and that mastodon is on display there. So when that animal was alive, that's when the earliest Native Americans looked like the little guy you see here, and he lives in caves or rock shelters. As time went on and man evolved, he learned how to create better weapons and tools. So now I'd like to pick up the story in the green display behind you. So if everyone likes, would like to make a half circle around the green display, it's easier for everyone to see. And not to worry for those of you that can't quite get a good look at the certain things while I'm talking about it. When I'm done speaking in a room, you're more than welcome to hang back and get a closer look at some of the items in the display. On the back wall, you'll see an addle addle or spear thrower. This was one of the first levers. It was also um, the first Indian weapon. It was um, a spear. So by using the addle addle, the Indian could double his thrusting power and hit an animal at about 50 yards away. And the addle addle was made by um, using a hickory as the wooden part of the, the shaft there. And then they would use a handle on one end made out of antler or bone. And on the other end, there's a hook made out of bone or antler, which fit into a notch at the end of the spear. So by using the atlatl, the Indian was able to double his thrusting power and hit an animal at about 50 yards away. The shiny polished stone that you see in the center of the shaft was called a banner stone, is called a banner stone, and that was added for swing weight. To the left in the display, you'll see a bola, which is another prehistoric weapon simply rawhide strips with rocks tied on various ends and it was swung in a circular motion around the Native American's head and then he would whip it at let's say a flock of turkey. The bola would then entangle the bird's legs and wings causing him to slow down, stumble, and then the Native American could close in and capture his meal for the day. On the back wall you'll see a post mold. And I used to think the post mold was kind of boring and why do they have it in the first display until I went to an archaeological dig site and actually saw post molds. It was really exciting at that point. Um, a post mold was a pit dug in the ground that supported the post that held up their bark homes. And years ago when the natives were forced to leave the area, their lodges were burnt to the ground. The post then left a discoloration in the soil, which was a clue to archaeologists that there was once a village site in the area. So 
chants his trunk, and as the wood began to burn and char, the native would hammer away at it with his axe. So now your choice. We can all group together in the bark house, and I'll talk about it then. Or mm. we can walk through. It was built to scale, so it's about the same size home that a Native American family would build to live in. This is a platform, and the Indian word for platform was hasum. You guys can say that word? Hasum. Very good. Very good. Sometimes they made them like bunk beds so that they had storage space above and below. They never slept there because the cooking fire was constantly burning and the smoke rose so slowly from the fire through the smoke hole in the ceiling that the natives always had a two or three foot layer of smoke ever present inside their home, which is why Native Americans sat cross-legged on the ground Indian style. It wasn't really a custom or tradition, it was out of necessity so that they would be beneath the smoke layer. And these, these homes are built by lashing saplings together with the inner bark of a basswood tree or they used rawhide strips. So at the base of each sapling is a post mold. It's just a pit dug in the ground that supported the posts. Then they would layer sheets of elm or oak bark in a shingle fashion around the frame and they uh, would drill small holes in the bark with a stone drill that they made. And they would lash these shingles to the inner framework with the uh, rawhide strips. So because of their poorly insulated homes, the Native Americans su suffered from arthritis at early ages. And believe it or not, the average lifespan back then of a Native American was like 40 years old. 40 years old. Mm -hmm. Now I'd like to have you move into the next room. Watch your step in the doorway. There's one small step up. Thanks, Maria. Make a big circle. This is real. This is just like a drawing. And this is the one you can see. So here you go. And as you're looking at that display, I'll explain where the Delaware Indians received the name Delaware. There were over 10,000 Delaware or Lenny Lenape Indians that lived throughout New York and New Jersey and Pennsylvania years ago. And what happened to them is a very sad story. It's a story that's true for many North American Indian tribes. They were discovered by a gentleman who had a title, and his title was Lord de Loire. He discovered the Delaware Bay. So when he saw the natives living along the banks of the Delaware, he called them Delaware Indians. That's where they received the name Delaware. Their own name was Lenny Lenape, and that means ordinary or original people. And the Iroquois Indians of New York State called them grandfather. And that's one reason why we believe they were one of the first woodland tribes to settle here in this part of Pennsylvania many years ago. Um, you'll also notice there's a garden there. Women did all the farming on a worldwide basis. These Indian women planted corn, pumpkin, squash, and bean seeds in the same mound of earth with a fish head for fertilizer. The corn grew first, the beans grew up the corn stalk, so that eliminated the need for bean poles. And they say that the squash and pumpkin plants, which have vines and big flat leaves that hang low to the ground, they say that discouraged rabbits and animals from getting into their gardens. Anyway. Um, over time, because they planted the same vegetables in the same plot of earth year after year, it would deplete the minerals in the soil. So today, they kind of alternate uh, crops. Years ago, when this occurred, they would pick up their village and relocate. That is why sometimes archaeologists find one village site right on top of another. Because at some point in time, another clan moved into that area. So I had mentioned Lenny Lenape being their own name for themselves. In the Lenny Lenape tribe, they had three different clans. Muncie was the wolf clan. Can you say that word? Muncie. Very good. Tur Muncie. 
ecological. You guys did good. So that's the turkey clan. And then the turtle clan was Yunami. Yunami. So they had the Muncie wolf clan, the unecological turkey clan, and the Yunami, which was the turtle clan. So um, when they would group to when they would group together for different festivities, they sometimes they married into different clans. Okay. Now here in the green display we have our pottery or Indian dishes. This is a Susquehanna water jug, and the marks around the top are indicative of the Muncie or the Wolf Clan. So when archaeologists find bits of pottery, that's a clue to them as to which clan lived in that area. The first piece that you see in the window was discovered four miles from the museum. It's been carbon dated, it's over a thousand years old. And it's called Milo Cord Pottery. The woman who made that used a stick that was wrapped with cord to smooth the outside and it left the imprint on the clay. That one uh, we're lucky to have today. The second piece, we're very fortunate to have it intact. It was originally obtained in 17, early 1700s by a local, local family, and they had lived in Shawnee on the Delaware years ago. Mm -hmm. Their last name was Tribal. They are from East Stroudsburg. Um, and they passed that piece of pottery from generation to generation. So that's why I say we're so lucky to have that intact today. The little old gentleman was saving spare change in it oh. <laughs> before we got it. This piece is also a Muncie pottery. The curator's wife tried to put this one back together and she never could fit the rim around the top. So he tells everyone that the doctors finally gave the okay to let her out of the home any day now. But anyway, they used Elmer's glue to glue these pieces back together because um, it's water-based, soluble. If they put a piece in the wrong spot, they can always steam it to move it into a different spot. But she never could fit the rim around the top. I think they say you're always supposed to start at the top and go down. So these were made with a coiling method. The American Indian never invented a wheel. So without a potter's wheel to make their pottery, they used the coiling method. This was done by digging a cone-shaped hole in the ground with a stick. Then they line the hole in the ground with clay, like you line a pie tin with dough. At ground level, they would coil long, skinny loops of clay until they had it to the size and shape they were interested in. And when they had it to their liking, they'd smooth the outside with a wet stick put their marks around the rim, they had to let it dry in the sun for eight to ten days. When it was completely dry, a very hot fire was built out of oak wood. Oak is very dense, it burns very hot. These pieces would then be pushed into the coals of the fire. Eventually they turned white from the heat. They would then remove them and let them cool, and when they wrapped them with their finger, if it gave a ring like chinaware, it was tempered and they could cook from it. If it gave a dull thudding sound, that meant it had cracked because there was a little moisture in it when they tried to fire it. They would usually just discard it. So as I said, the first piece is Milo Cord Pottery, and these, these two pieces are definitely from the Muncie clan or the Wolf clan. Long way today with its hybrid corn. The sad thing is, we have genetically engineered corn which grows fast during our short growing seasons, but then it attracts the monarch butterflies and it kills them. So it's, you know, one against the other. But today our hybrid corn is much larger than uh, yesterday's Indian corn. And they also gathered acorns, butternuts, sunflower seeds, black walnuts, hickory nuts, any kind of wild berry, and we'll talk more about that in the fifth room. But I just basically want you to take notice of the size of the corn. Our <laughs> agriculture has come a long way today with it. Soft wood, and as they spun that dowel and it created the heat from the friction, they would add oxygen and bits of tinder like dry bark, moss, whatever they had that was very dry, something from a bird nest, and then that would um, create their fire. Or they would borrow from the neighbor a coal or something. Hello. That's a copperhead. It's, it's very, um, a copper color. The bathroom, I think they had a designated spot in the ground. That's a good question.
Did everyone notice the missing? <laughs> so his name is Meesing, and Meesing is spelled M E E S I N G. Meesing, Meesing spirit protected the animals of the forest and made sure that years ago, Native Americans living at opposite ends of the country had a belief in a creature which was similar and they didn't even speak the same language. And in the West Coast, they had Bigfoot or Sasquatch. So haven't we always found fossils or remains dating back to the dinosaurs? Yes. Have they ever found a Bigfoot? <laughs> it was really a Native American portrayed the Bigfoot, or me sing. So when these natives here in the East were pushed on a westward migration, today, I mean, they have TV reality shows, they have, you know, sightings of Bigfoot. It makes me think maybe it's a Native American sticking to customs and traditions from their past. Because we've discovered fossils and back to the dinosaurs, and they've never found a Bigfoot. Yeah. So his spirit was there. I kind of think it's like our Santa today. Because sightings of the Meesing were either two times out of the year. So that's why I say maybe when these sightings of Bigfoot are, are, are made in the West, maybe it's just a Native American trying to stick to customs and traditions from their past. Now here in the yellow display, we have the art of flint napping or methods of flaking. The arrow on the back wall is a Delaware Indian arrow. The shaft is made out of hickory. The tip on the end is called Side Notched Unendogged Chert, which is just another name, fancy name for New York State Flint. The feather on the end, oh, who knows what kind of a feather that is on the end of the arrow? Yeah? What kind of bird do you think it is? I'll give you a hint. Should I give you a hint? November 25th? We all have it for dinner. <laughs> See, you guys did good. That's from the wing of a wild turkey feather. Do you know the curator had a group of Cub Scouts in here, and when he asked them what kind of a feather they thought that was, one of them thought it might have been a raccoon feather. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looks like it. In this area, the Native Americans used flint, jasper, and quartz to make their spear points and arrowheads. These three points are spear points, and the second two on the right are arrowheads. So if you're ever lucky enough to find a point, um, spear points are older than arrowheads, and you just need to do a little bit of research to um, identify if it was a spear point or arrowhead. They used hammer stones, indirect percussion and direct percussion to flatten their piece, and when they had it to their liking, the last step was pressure flaking, where they put buckskin in the palm of their hand so they did not cut themselves, and with an antler, they would press and twist simultaneously. So at the same time, they would press and twist. The Indians were wearing too? Yeah. yeah. Okay, here's a different view from this side of the room. Yeah. Yeah. Food are sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one is used for foods and the other is used for plants. Oh, so here in the last room, we have plants that are used for foods and medicines. Lamb's quarters is actually wild spinach. They, they gathered blueberries, elderberries, chokeberries, blackberries, cranberries, strawberries, mulberries, gooseberries. They, tr they dried them and they stored them over the long, hard winter months when hunt hunting was scarce. And they made uh, dandelion spring tonic, which is probably like my grandmother's dandelion wine, but they call it a spring tonic. Um, they added wild garlic to their venison. They made persimmons bread. They made flour from acorns, chestnuts, the Indian potato, corn, and they mixed all kinds of dried berries and nuts into their flour. So they had quite a variety there. They gathered black walnuts, butternuts, hickory nuts, amaranth uh, was ground into flour as well. They made a tea from wintergreen, which cured kidney disorders. They knew how to make the medicine from the root of a cattail, which dissolved kidney stones. And they also, um, they made a tea from skunk cabbage to cure whooping cough. I've been told they would take the essence from a skunk and put it on the patient's chest. I kind of prefer to call him a victim. And I think that was to keep everyone else away from him. They would know that he was sick. And that probably really opened up his sinuses, I'm sure. Um, they obtained vitamin C from the wild rose hips. And dwarf shumac was used to make a juice 
It tastes like cranberry juice. They call it Indian lemonade. Now there are different varieties of shumac. One of them is poisonous. It'll give you a rash. Now there's a picture of And there's also a picture of today's chief feeler. And then I'm going to ask for your attention here at the map, and I'll I'll explain why there are no longer any groups of Native Americans. It's a sad story. It's a story that's true for many North American Indian tribes. These people were thrown from the Stone Age into modern technology at the time, guns, liquor. They had no immunity to diseases which were coming over from Europe. It's so sad, and I hate to say it, but it was even a great colonial trick to give a Native American clothing or blanket that was worn by someone who had smallpox or measles. If one Native took the clothing or blanket back to the village, it infected the entire clan, and the colonists acquired more land that way. Now, I'm going to talk about um, how the Native Americans had no concept of owning land. To them, trying to own the land would be to try owning the air in this room. The earth was their mother, and they couldn't understand why why the colonists wanted to fence off pieces of land and keep them from hunting there. So when William Penn came into the country, he was friendly with the Native Americans. He went back to Europe. His son, Thomas Penn, was here and wanted to move Native Americans off part of Pennsylvania so that he could bring colonists in. So what had happened was, the king owed the admiral a debt. The admiral was William Penn's father. The king gave him Penn's woods in the New World. So William came over here. He went back to overseas. His sons came over and devised a treaty. And this was called the Walking Purchase Treaty of 1737. So at the time, there were over 10,000 Delaware Indians living throughout the tri-state area. William, William Penn's son, Thomas Penn, devised a treaty that said the distance a man could walk in one day and a half would be one side of a parcel of land the Indians would give the colonists. And at the end of the walk, they were to take the line directly to the Delaware River. So the natives thought the maximum amount of property the colonists might acquire would be 25,000 acres. Instead of the 25,000 acres, the foot runner, Thomas Penn hired three English foot runners. Edward Marshall was the lead runner that day. Marshall's Creek is named after him. He covered a distance of 65 miles where Edward Marshall fell over in Jim Thorpe. Instead of taking the line directly to the Delaware River, they took the line parallel to the river, which meant they just acquired the entire upper Delaware Valley and it added up to half a million acres. So all the natives that lived here were forced to burn their lodges and start a westward migration. There were over 300 different tribes living throughout the country then. The Delawares were a peaceful group of people. They started to intermarry with different Indian tribes. So today, we have less than 2,000 Delaware Indians of mixed blood living in Oklahoma, Wisconsin, Colorado, and southern Canada. But when we first opened our museum in 1976, there was just one full-blooded Delaware Indian left, and I have a picture of her under the bear hide. Her Indian name is Touching Leaves. Her English name is Nora Thompson Dean. She was the last full-blooded Delaware Indian, the last fluent speaker of the Lenape language, and unfortunately, um, she passed away in the early 80s. So um, when that occurred, that was the end of the Delaware line. There are no longer any full-blooded Delaware Indians, which is such a sad story because I truly believe there's still a lot we can learn from the Native Americans even today. Um, this is a gift shop. This is the last one. Two stores at the same time. Okay. Is there a mo upstairs? Yep. 
silver saya cani kuliah zanda. Ready ni ni, kira. Ada China lagi nak buat macam ni. Ibu kos kotor. Ah, tiri lagi.